Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of D News Plus. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Amy, and I'm going to be guest hosting for Trace all week this week. In this episode, number one of five, we're going to start talking about NASA's Gemini program. We're going to talk about its purpose, where it came from, and why it was so important in the race to getting to the moon by the end of the 1960s. So make sure you subscribe to get all five parts of this. But before we get into really the nitty gritty of the Gemini program, let's start at the beginning and look at where NASA started off in space with the Mercury program. So. The first question really is, what is the Gemini Space Program? This is not something that a lot of people have heard of. When you think about America's history in space or space history, you think about the Mercury Program, which was NASA's first ever manned spaceflight program, or you think about the Apollo Program, which was the program that took men to the moon. Gemini was the one in the middle. I often think of it as NASA's overlooked middle child, but it really shouldn't be overlooked because it was arguably the most important part of getting to the moon. Gemini was the program that really taught NASA how to live and work and fly in space. Without Gemini, we wouldn't have figured out all of the things we needed to get Apollo to the moon. So to understand where Gemini fits in the context, we need to start at the beginning and we need to start by looking at the Mercury program. The Mercury program was NASA's first ever space program. It was incepted not long after the agency formed in 1958. The first seven astronauts were um, joined the Space Corps in 1959. The goal of the Mercury program was to get a man in space have him orbit the Earth and return safely, ideally before the Russians got a cosmonaut up in orbit. The initial program was to have each of the seven astronauts make a short suborbital flight, just a 15-minute kind of up-and-down pop gun shot, before sending all seven into orbital missions, and the missions would get longer as the program wore on. This would be a way for NASA to figure out everything about spaceflight, because at this point, no one knew if in zero gravity if a man could swallow, because there's no gravity to help food move down the esophagus. There were questions about whether in no gravity his eyes would distort and he wouldn't be able to see the cockpit in front of him. There were a lot of a lot of unknowns and that's just the human of course the technical unknowns and how how to actually build a spacecraft. All of this was the goal of the Mercury program. The Mercury program did achieve its major goals but only in part. It didn't get an American astronaut in space before the Soviet Union launched a cosmonaut. Yuri Gagarin launched into orbit on April 12th of 1961 and America got Alan Shepard up on May 5th of 1961 but Shepard didn't go into orbit. He just went up and down in 15 minutes and splashed down about 300 miles away from where he launched. So it was a good mission. It was a step for America, but it wasn't as good a step as the Soviet Union. On the heels of being beaten into orbit by the Soviet Union, NASA had to figure out what to do next to kind of regain some upper hand in space. And what the agency was already looking for was going to the moon, but it was on the books as like a distant goal, like 1970 or beyond, something that would come after there was a lot of spaceflight in low Earth orbit just to understand how spaceflight worked. But after Gagarin went up before an American astronaut, it kind of shifted the balance for NASA. NASA didn't now didn't have the time to wait to really learn how to fly in space. It had to come up with some goal that would allow it to achieve this space first and become the dominant space power. And that goal became the moon. So 20 days after Alan Shepard's 15 minute suborbital pop gun shot, President Kennedy promised America the moon by the end of the decade. This is the famous, I propose that this nation should achieve the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. So this is May of 1961 and already the program that has an internal name of Apollo is already starting to come together. So the problem is that getting to the moon is a lot harder than just going up into orbit, something which, remember, America hasn't done yet. So the the next stage in planning for Apollo is figuring out how to go to the moon. And there are all kinds of different ways you can go. You can take a massive spacecraft, launch it all the way, just do not pass go, just straight to the moon, and land it upright such that it's, it's almost like a rocket in itself, and it launches right straight up off the moon's surface to come back to Earth. You can launch multiple smaller rockets off the Earth and assemble your larger spacecraft in, in low Earth orbit, and then send that whole thing to the moon and have it land and come back. There were all kinds of different proposals, and all of them required new rockets, new technologies. If we're going to build something in orbit, we have to figure out how to do that, how to build something in space instead of launching it a huge thing off the Earth. All of this came down to what was called the mission mode decision. And there was another very um, very unpopular mode that came out in late 1961 called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. And this was the way of going to the moon with Apollo that would 
leave the heaviest part of the spacecraft, which is basically just the fuel you need to get home, in orbit around the moon. So that Apollo would go with one spacecraft and then a dedicated lunar lander would land on the surface and then come back up, rendezvous or meet with that, that basically the fuel tank spacecraft, the main spacecraft in Earth orbit, or in lunar orbit rather, and then come back to Earth. This required a whole other set of challenges because now all of a sudden Apollo is taking shape We need to get people to the moon, which no one has done. We need to figure out how to keep them alive for the journey to the moon. It takes about three days to get to the moon, three days to get back. You're not just going to go and come back right away. You're going to spend some time on the moon, so throw in a few days there. The longest average mission, they thought, would be about two weeks. So keep men alive for two weeks in space and comfortable and fed and all those basic human needs that you have. You have to figure out how to get the spacecraft connected in a gravity field that is not the Earth's, that we don't have any experience in, and also how to bring them back safely. And now you have nine years to figure all that out. So in 1962, it starts to come out that the the Apollo program is taking shape as this very complex lunar orbit rendezvous mission with two spacecraft operating simultaneously around the moon, quarter of a million miles away. NASA has put two men into orbit twice. <laughs> um, so it's not, there, there's a huge leap that has to happen between these very simple orbital missions on Mercury and the lunar landing mission. Apollo was not going to be ready when Mercury was finished to, to be able to just kind of keep NASA in space and keep moving ahead. So the idea came to develop a second program called the Mercury Mark II program, which would be a larger version of Mercury. It would figure out all the things you needed to do on Apollo. It would do the long duration space flight. It would, you know, you're not gonna go to the moon and look out the window, you're gonna step outside. So it would teach men how to leave a spacecraft and actually operate in the vacuum of space. It would be the, learn how to rendezvous and dock two spacecraft so that you would have that practice when you're at the moon. This program was eventually in 1962 renamed Gemini. And that is how this interim program came to be. It came to be because it had to meet the needs of Apollo where there was nothing that could meet that need. So the demands on Gemini were really, really high when this program was created in early 1962. And it had the tightest timeline because on the one hand, Early 1962, Mercury is still flying and it's still just simple orbital orbital missions. On the other end is Apollo going to the moon come hell or high water by the end of 1969 and you have this program that has just been created building off Mercury but completely changing the game that has to solve all of the problems that are associated with going to the moon in the mid-1960s. So... Gemini is is that mid-step that without it we would not have had. It's it's the bridge to the moon. We would not have been able to develop the technology. And that to me is why it's such a fascinating program because the the risk, everything that it had to take on so quickly and that it accomplished all of the goals. One more note before we move on to actually discussing what the Gemini program did is the pronunciation of Gemini. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard it pronounced Gemini like the constellation. Um, Gemini was named for the constellation. It was the first spacecraft to take multiple men. There were two astronauts on board, so it did kind of call back to the twins of the constellation. But NASA wanted to pronounce it differently and pronounced it Gemini. Look up any any old NASA archive footage, your newsreels from the Gemini program, they all pronounce it Gemini. So it might sound a little bit weird to you guys, but I promise this is how it's pronounced when you're discussing the program for NASA. So that's the basic rundown of the Gemini program, where it fits in and why it's so important and why I love it so much. Tomorrow, we're going to start getting into the details. And up first, we're going to discuss long duration space flight and fuel cells. Specifically, we're going to be talking about Gemini missions three, five, and seven. So be sure to subscribe so you get all that. And let us know in the comments, what are your favorite NASA missions? One of mine is Gemini 7. We'll get to that one later, but let us know what you love. If you want to watch more about space right now, Trace did a great series about aliens, or you can watch an episode that Trace and I did together about what happens when you exercise too much. Thanks for watching and see you guys next time.